Okay, we're going to begin um, chapter four talking about how compounds exist in water. So we're talking first about aqueous solution. Um, so we can't talk about reactions in solution until we really establish what we mean by aqueous solutions and what are the various terms associated with that. Okay, so as a reminder, we have identified or classified compounds prior to this. That's going to be important again. Um, so recognize ionic compounds, which are generally, you know, 90% of the time, um, the metal and non-metal combination. The acids, which typically start with an H that produce H plus when in water and the corresponding anion. Bases are a new class of compound which have the hydroxide ion produced in water. Um, so NH3 is in that group and you may not understand why NH3 will produce OH minus in water, um, but for this period of time, we're just going to assume you memorize that NH3 is one of our bases, okay? So it does produce OH minus when in water. It's a very um, important exception. The rest of the bases that we're going to be looking at have hydroxide ion in them. Now, it is true that sodium hydroxide could also be classified as ionic, so it has two categories, um, barium hydroxide as well, because there's cations and anions involved. Now, molecular compounds, when they are put into water, do not break up into ions. So they stay together in their formula unit. And you'll notice here, there's no chemistry involved. We're just saying, um, using this formula to show you what's happening, that the liquid, in this case, ethanol, when mixed with water, just becomes ethanol aqueous. That's the only change. It's going to be homogenous, so the ethanol and the water are actually going to hydrogen bond with each other and make this nice mixture. So there's a different mechanism involved when you dissolve a molecular compound that's not the same as an ionic compound. So this table is just a reminder of some of the uh, different examples of molecular compounds and ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are also called salt. So you hear me say salt, I mean an ionic compound. So salt is a general way to describe ionic compounds. So remember, NH3 is going to be considered a base. That's an important exception. The rest of the bases are going to have hydroxide ions in them. And remember, this type of base can also be classified as a salt or ionic compound. So some of the terms that we use when we talk about solutions are solvent, um, solute, and solution that we've learned before. Um, solution is a homogeneous mixture, and that solution does not have to be a liquid solution. Um, the solute is the thing that is being dissolved, and the solvent is what it's being dissolved into. And the solvent is always present in the greater amount. The solute is always present in the lesser amount. Since we are covering aqueous solutions, the solvent we're using in this chapter is water, but keep in mind that solutions can be anything, such as air. So I could say that oxygen is a solute and nitrogen is a solvent because the air is 78% nitrogen and it's air is homogeneous. Um, so that would be an example of a solution. But for now, we're going to be dealing with solutes that are either liquids or solids and would classified or be classified as molecular, ionic, or um, bases. Okay, molecular, ionic, or bases. Oh, I left out acids or acids. Okay, the AQ symbol means aqueous. It is a state, as I mentioned before. So again, solution is made up of the solute. And the solvent, you can have more than one solute, but we're going to focus on one solute in this particular um, part of the chapter. There's a term that we use, it's the term called solvated. Um, so when an ionic compound dissolves in water, we say it's solvated um, because the solvent molecules are actually going to surround the cation and the anions, which become separated from one another. If the solvent is water, we refer to it as being hydrated. 
Okay, this picture will help a little bit. So this is a picture of sodium chloride. And you can see that the water molecules surround the ions as this sodium chloride is being dissolved. The red side of the um, water molecules is the negative side because it's polar and that would point towards the positive cation. And in this case, the positive end of the polar molecule, the little white hydrogens, that would point towards the negative ion. So cations and anions are separated. This is showing it the process. It hasn't completely separated yet, but it, it would eventually. Okay. So again, that's referred to as hydration. So um, strong, the word electrolyte refers, refers to anything that produces ions and conducts electricity. Strong electrolytes are those that are essentially 100% ionized in water. Um, so soluble salts such as copper chloride and sodium chloride, that's copper two chloride, sorry, would, would be examples of strong electrolytes and strong acids. And there's only six of them, we'll learn those. Um, strong acids would also be considered strong electrolytes. And we use a single arrow to indicate that this is going in one direction. So for a very large amount of solid in water, all of it's going to be on the right-hand side. You would have none of the original sodium chloride left. Of course, there's a limit to solubility. You keep adding it, of course, eventually it would um, come out of solution, but that's another topic. Um, so hydrogen chloride is a gas, and that gas, when um, bubbled through water, makes hydrochloric acid. All of the gas then becomes aqueous, so you don't have any of the original HCl in there. That's considered to be a strong electrolyte because it's a strong acid. Uh, strong electro electrolytes are highly conductive. That's why they get their name. Um, so this would be a reason you don't want to go swimming in a body of water because most water, unless it's zero ohm water or zero water, meaning it's been completely um, distilled several times to get rid of every bit of ion in there. Even a distilled water is going to have some um, ions in it. Okay, so you're going to be doing an experiment on that to show that. Just like there are strong electrolytes, there are non-electrolytes and weak electrolytes. Non-electrolytes are molecular compounds typically that don't dissolve. So the acetic acid in the previous slide was one example. There are lots of examples. Weak electrolytes are going to be considered weak um, acids, or it could be ammonia, which is a weak base, or it could be uh, insoluble ionic compound. So the strong electrolytes, again, from the previous slide were strong acids and soluble, meaning they dissolve in a very large amount, ionic compounds. Whereas weak electrolytes could be weak acids, it could be uh, slightly soluble or mostly insoluble ionic compounds, and uh, weak bases. Okay, so anything the word weak is considered to be a weak electrolyte or a slightly soluble salt. Non-electrolytes, typically molecular compounds that aren't acids or bases. Okay, I should have a double arrow here. This is not appropriate. I should have double arrow here. The double arrow would indicate that any particular time I still have some of my acetic acid present. Okay, so this is considered to be a weak electrolyte. Notice that I have an anion and a cation form, so it will be somewhat conductive. When it says less than 100% ionization, typically this is really low. This is like 20%. By the way, acetic acid is what we have in vinegar, which is a 3% solution on the stove shelf. Examples of non-electrolytes, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have the um, dissolution of ethanol, which starts out as a liquid, becomes aqueous. That's not chem chemical, that's not a chemical change, that's just a physical change. Other examples would be sugar, ethylene glycol, anything that's molecular is gonna can dissolve, but it dissolves by a different mechanism than normal, okay? So the next uh, video, we're going to be talking about the words soluble and insoluble as it relates to ionic compounds.